We are again, folks. This is Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. <clears throat> the subject matter that we're going to look at today is how can we succeed in all areas of our life, physically, spiritually, mentally, intellectually, in our own little realm, at our home, or at our place of work, or out on the sidewalk, or in, a, in a, any setting that you can put a human being in, how can we maintain this prosperity that God would have us have intellectually, financially, and all other areas that you might think of in life, physically even. Now, you may have a physical disorder, but that doesn't render you useless. I know many people with physical disorders whose minds are just as sharp as anybody else's, whose ability to do with their mind and with their heart what you have to do to maintain happiness in spite of the drawback that you may have physically. Now we can have a physical drawback and be good spiritually, but this is one thing you can't have. You can't have a spiritual drawback and maintain a good physical life. You have to have your spiritual life in place. In John uh, chapter 14 in the book of the Bible he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now John is speaking of Jesus here and he's saying that Jesus is the one you must believe in. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That is my encouragement. He is encouraging me to follow what he says in his book, the Bible, and he is guaranteeing me full success on this earth in every single thing that I do that's within his will and his realm, even though I'm on the earth. Have you ever heard the saying, a little bit of heaven on earth? That's where we can live today. We can have a little bit of heaven in the middle of chaos on this earth. Verse 3 and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Wow. He's saying that I'm going to come get you and take you to where I am, and you will also be there with me forever. Let's look at verse 4. And whether I go ye know, and the way ye know. How did, how, why was he saying this to those people that he was with? He was saying this because he had showed them the way. And he had told them the way. And if you're in the way, you're going. And that's it. Now you might not be the best a follower in the way, but you need to be. Do you remember that the way was what the church was called in its original state? When it first came into being, it was called the way. It was, and that was what it was called. Now, let's look. Thomas, who, uh, his name was Thomas, but he was Didymus, he was a doubter. So he's asking Jesus a question. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? This is a little bit of doubt coming here. And Jesus had been showing them the way. And he had been telling them where he was going. But Thomas wanted to expel the doubt that was in his mind. So he asked is in this. And then verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If had ye known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth we know him that have seen him. Now, Thomas, Jesus kind of rebukes him in a little sense of the word. Thomas, I've been with you this long, and I have been telling you, this is what I've been telling you, and you haven't received it yet. Doubt will keep you from receiving. Doubt will keep you in the place to where you're unsuccessful. You want to be successful? It takes total belief. What is a successful operator of an automobile? I can go set out there in my automobile for hours. If I do not turn the key over, it's not going to go anywhere. To be an excess, successful operator, I have to turn the key and, and get it going. Then I have to put it in gear. And then it will get going. Many Christians today are like a man sitting in a car who has never turned the key over. They're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. Because they won't follow the first uh, thing that you're told to do. First thing you're told to do, get in the Word. Get in the Word. You've got to get in the Word of God. If you're not in the Word, you can be in the driver's seat sitting there, but until you turn the key over, which is open the Word, you're not going anywhere. So after you turn the key over, what happens? You've got to pull it in gear after that. And, and, and uh, I can't talk right now. I'll call you back in about 15 minutes. And you got to be in the Word. And if you're in the Word, then you have the motor running. But once you get the motor running, then when you pull it in gear, you're going, you're ready to go. Now what you got to do, you take a hold of the steering wheel and you drive the direction you want to go. Well, if you're in the Word, the Word will give you direction. If you're not in the Word, your direction is come see, come sigh. It's any direction the wind blows. So what you must do is you must get in the direction God wants you to go. And the only way you can find that is by the road map. And the road map that you've got to follow is the Bible. Look what Jesus says right here in Joshua 1 and 8. Back in the Old Testament now. He said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Well, if it's not going to depart out of thy mouth, how are you going to know if you don't know it? You've got to know it. See? That thou shalt meditate therein day and night. We are to meditate in God's word day and night. It is the road map for our life daily. It is the road map for peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, and everything else that we possibly need. that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. What are we talking about in this excerpt? We're not talking about just having good success, even though we'd like to see that. I would like to see perfect success. Not just good, but better than good. Our good is good, but excellent is better. So I'd like to see that. Uh, look at whatever you do will prosper. If we look at Psalm 1, 2, and 3. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. These are written by prosperous men. In this psalm, David writes this psalm. He was a prosperous person in this stage of his life. And he was a prospering person throughout his life. Did he have some failures? 
When he got out of the word of God, he failed. As long as he stayed in the word, he did not fail. The minute that tempter, Satan, came by and tempted him, and he listened to the tempter and got out of the word, he failed. But we have a gracious God that says, If you will ask me, David, and David did, forgive me, God. And after God forgave him, you know what God did with it? He buried it. It's not like that proverbial picture that we see of a husband and a wife or something and a hatchet in the back with a handle sticking out. Oh, I forgive you, but every now and then I'm going to pull on that handle. No, God cut the handle off. When he forgave us, there's no handle sticking out. It's perfectly forgiven and all is behind us and we start new. You say, Brother Peter, how many times can you do that? Just as many as you have to. Just as many times as you have to, you can do that. God will forgive you over and over and over again because we are human beings. We are led, attempted, and when we're drawn away, the Bible said, drawn away of our own lust. One of David's biggest problems was when he had lust of the flesh. And God forgave him. A little while later, it happened again. God forgave him. You see, how many times will God forgive him? A hundred times a hundred and more. He'll forgive every human being who is in this weak body. We are in a fleshly body and this is not a godly body and until we get our godly bodies we will be drawn by our lust in this body. We must keep our minds clear and our hearts clear in order to do the procedure that God said to do that we can be 100% successful in our life and this is what we need but he delights in the law of the Lord and he doth meditate day and night on the law of the Lord how can you meditate on something you don't know that's the thing and he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in due season have you ever seen, I, we, were, we, were, we were working behind the church a little while ago and there was a persimmon tree. And under that persimmon tree was just littered, covered with unripe persimmons that before that time they fell off. They had fallen on the ground before their time. We don't want that to happen to us. We don't want our fruit to fall off the tree before it's ripe. So therefore, we've got to stay in the season. His leaf shall not wither. How about that? And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Every single thing that I do, I want to see prosper. In life, I'm a paint contractor. By work, I have been a paint contractor for 50 years, 60 years, 50 years, 50-something years, 57 years, I've been a paint contractor. And what I've done is life was prospered. Only because God made it prosper. Because I'm following Him. I want to excel in wisdom and understanding. How do I excel in wisdom and understanding? Uh, uh, look at uh, Psalm 119 and 97 and Psalm 100. And it said, uh, uh, Oh, how love I thy law. Wow. Do you love the book that Jesus left behind? Do you love the Bible? Do you love the way of life Jesus left behind for us? This is our directional. As years gone by, we had to carry a McNeely, uh, a RAN, uh, a MacBook with us to get anywhere. 
Now you punch in your telephone and it'll take you where you want to go. But back then, that Rand McNeely was like the Bible when you were traveling. Without it, you couldn't get where you wanted to go. You didn't know the way or anything. You couldn't find it. But now, uh, we have the Bible. And it's going to give us the way. It's going to give us understanding more than all of the teachers of the world. All of the teachers of the world, unless they're teaching you out of the Bible, cannot teach you the way of life that the Bible teaches you. It by itself stands alone. No other book, no other method, no other anything can touch the way of the Bible. Not at all. Keeping His commandments. Keeping His commandments that I might not sin against him. Do you know a sin against God is also a sin against yourself? When you sin against God and you lay down at night and God said, hey, Peter, that was a sin. Why is it a sin against me too? Because it's made me uncomfortable. It's made me unhappy. It's made me in the place to where I know that I failed I not only God, but I failed my ability to follow something spiritually. And so therefore I must take care of that. Have you ever passed by somebody that you had the opportunity to speak to them about Jesus? And Jesus said, speak to that man. Give him a track. I have these tracks in my pocket. A track is a thing that t says, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? And I walked by him and I lay down at night. And the Lord said, you remember that woman you passed today that I nudged you and said, hand her a track. And you didn't do it. Yes, Lord, forgive me. Help me not to do that anymore. Help me to touch that one I was supposed to. Yesterday, God laid on my heart directly to give this man a track. Now you know what I got to do? I got to find out where that man lives. And I got to find out who knows who, where he lives or whatever, and I have got to go find him, and I've got to knock on his door, and I got to say, Sir, God told me to give this to you when I was talking to you the other day, and I did not hand it to you. I got waylaid by this and that and two or three things, and I had it in my hand, and I couldn't get to him to give it back to him. And now I got to find him and give it to him. Why? Because it's heavy on my heart that I didn't do what God said for me to do. If you live close enough to the Lord, you'll know when you miss the mark. It's like a man shooting an arrow. And he has a reputation of hitting the mark. He has that reputation of hitting that mark. And he's waylaid by something. He, he saw something over here and he, he glanced over there and came back and released his arrow. And it missed the mark. We've got to be careful. We don't let something outside of what we're doing affect our shooting at the mark. Luke was an erudite. That means he was exact, hit the mark every time he turned an arrow loose. The book of Luke, everything that he wrote was backed up by three. Three entities backed up everything Luke said. Luke didn't say anything. He didn't have three things to back him up. When he wrote, he wrote, I know this because so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. Or this, that, or what? Or this, that, or that. And, and he put that in there. And he knew that he was correct in that area. Look. We're going to have new power when we get saved. When I got saved, I said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, November 5th, 1972, at 3 o'clock in the morning. A full-fledged alcoholic, a cusser, a life chill, everything under the sun that the devil would do, I did it. When I said, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Come in my heart and save my soul, he did. And when he came in my heart and saved my soul, he changed me completely. I've never taken another drink from that day to this. 
and never swore another cuss word from that day to this. Have I had many other problems? Yes, out here. Have I got some I still have to take care of? Yes. I'm sitting here right now talking to you and God's showing me a couple of problems that were in my life in the past that I hadn't settled or taken care of. I need to take care of. How, how long ago, Brother Peter? 30 years ago. 30 years ago, and I still have the burden to take care of those things. And haven't been quite able to do it yet, but I'm asking God to make it to where I can do it. And I'm working on that. He taught me also. How did he teach me? Proverbs 4.4 4. How does God teach a man to live a prosperous life? He teaches a man to live a prosperous life by his word. His word is where prosperity comes in. And as long as we're in his word, we can prosper in everything that we do. Listen to this. By meditating on the things, thyself holy to them, that they are profiting may appear to all. 1 Timothy 4 and 15. Why does God want us to prosper? So it will appear to all those who are watching us and are seeing a man that follows God that God is on his side and that what he does prospers. <clears throat> and it will prosper for them. This is a system that will work for anybody who will follow it. If you will follow it. I'm a man with an 8th grade certificate from school. No high school. But I went to a college, Titus Baptist Seminary, and I'd already been colleging in celibuses, different celibuses, for since in the 70s, I've been schooling. I schooled from the 70s till today, and I'm still schooling. I school day and night. I school, I'm in books. I'm writing, and I'm list, looking, and listening, and learning, and watching the Bible, and learning what the Bible verses say, and, and studying and uh, putting in mind uh, verses out of the Bible and Bible verses and chapters and, and things and trying to know uh, somebody says uh, Luke 10 uh, Luke chapter 10 I should be able to say well Luke chapter 10 is so and so and know the Bible enough to know where things are if, if you run a business and you're going to sell a lawnmower and you need to look in the book, you turn the book to lawnmowers. You know where it is. You've already got your book and you've already practiced and you know, I turn right here and I got lawnmowers. And then you go to Axis or something. You say, well, that's on 13. You turn over to 13. If you've learned your business good enough and you know it good enough, why don't you know the Bible good enough? Because that's the direction for your whole life. The Bible is a direction book. If it, if, if it is a, a cookbook for life, it has the best recipes in it for life. If, if every day was a recipe day, and you said, well, what do I put in here today? I can tell you where you start. You don't start with two eggs and bacon. You start with two Bible verses and a prayer. Or a prayer and two Bible verses. And get started. That's where you start. You start at the bottom of the pile. And you come up. And as you do that, you will, will uh, come up. I'm trying to see my... I can't see. Okay. Uh, my timer there. I'm only supposed to have a 30-minute window here. And the 30-minute window will give me a deal. And uh, it seems like I've got all kinds of things going on today. Phones ringing, people knocking on the door, and just every little thing. But I'm going to get through this. 
and we're going to get through it. The price of success. What is the price of success? I can tell you first thing, stewardship. The price of success is stewardship. If you are a good steward of God's word, you will be successful. If you are a good steward of God's word, you will <coughs> be successful. <clears throat> Have you ever heard the saying, that deserves to be said three times? So if I'm going to say this, if you are a good steward of God's word, you will be successful. How about that? Look at problem. Getting God's word daily. That is a problem in today's world. <clears throat> we seem to be so busy. I got news for you. I don't know what kind of person you are, but I haven't watched television now in, in many, many months. And during those months, God has enhanced my life greatly. To sit and watch the late news is going to rob you of getting up in the morning and feel like getting in God's Word before an hour before you go to work. Because you've depleted your body already by watching something of the world that matters not. It does not matter what is happening on the world news, believe it or not. It will not change you for the good to watch the news. Today, it will rob you of the peace of mind that you have over the good things that you learn on a daily basis in the Word. We don't have to know what's happening in all the world. I was born in the state of Maine where the only news you ever got was somebody saying something. <laughs> that, I remember when the TV first came out, it was a little round thing. Then it was a, a, a kind of an octagon-shaped thing, and then uh, it did all kinds of things. But I can tell you one thing it didn't do. It didn't enhance the world. It didn't make the world better. It made the world worse because it brought things in that didn't need to be in your life. What was the biggest thing you had to content with when you were growing up? Cotton firewood. That's what was important. To get the firewood cut in the main where we lived, we burned about 16 cords a winter. And that's, that's 128 square feet in a cord. And we burned 16 of them rascals every winter. Who cut it? We did. How did we cut it? With a saw. A cross cut, and then a hand cut saw. And I come home from school at night, I had to saw up a wood box full of wood and get it in there. And those were, were days when you, you lived that way. Now, I'm sawing scriptures. And that's where I am. God's word daily. If we spend less than one hour a day in God's word we're failing why would you say that brother Peter I spend an hour in a day eating making this old body fat should I not spend an hour a day making the soul happy making the soul grow making the soul be content how can you be content if you do not follow God. How can you follow God if you're not in His Word? Our time is about come and gone. I'm going to have to leave now. But I'm going to put some more of these on. Uh, if you will take them, eat them, and learn what I'm learning. You say, I think you've arrived, Peter. No, I haven't arrived. None of us have arrived, and I haven't arrived. And I won't arrive until I get this behind me this life behind me and I'm in heaven then will I have arrived but until then I won't be arrived so we'll see you next time brother Peter with tidbits from the word may God bless you and he will if you get in his book read it follow what it says 
We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.